Good evening and ahoy. This is the news. Susanna Gibson, a woman running for office in Virginia, promising a lot of new jobs, recently had a live streamed pornographic video leaked where viewers paid her and her husband money for various sexual acts on Chatterbait. So I guess the jobs that she will be promising everybody are foot, hand, and blow. Mm, yes. An Australian man has sued a hospital after doctors encouraged him to watch his wife give birth uh, via C-section. The man claims seeing this caused him physical unrest and destroyed his marriage. Now, normally, I would say this man's crazy, but we actually have photographic proof of the wife's mangled vagina. Oh, my Lord. Viewer discretion is advised. Oh. Mm. Mm. Terrifying. <laughs> it's the most, most disgusting vagina I've ever seen. Mm. Like to go to Beetlejuice with that one. Yes, there's beefy curtains. Mm. All right. Um, I'm trying to not vomit. All right. Uh, olive oil prices have surged recently due to low supply and high demand, with the average price coming in at $8,900 per ton. Ooh. Last time anything this virgin was expensive, Bill Clinton was going to Epstein Island. And welcome <laughs> to Normal World. I'm Dave Landau. I'm Quarter Black Garrett. And I'm very happy to introduce comedian, uh, one of, uh, a friend, really one of my favorite people. I think you're going to love him. Uh, please welcome uh, Yoshi Obayashi. Welcome, man. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Garrett and Dave. It's uh, good seeing you, Dave. Good to see you, sir. Thank you for coming in. I, I, I don't want to get right into it, but I guess we should just because I made the joke right now. Yeah. You were actually at the Ghislaine Maxwell trial. Yeah, I went uh, her... Um... Now, you weren't on the stand. It's important to let people... <laughs> yeah, you weren't. It was part of a yeah, pervert, but trial. not that big of a right. pervert, yes. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, when it started, I, I couldn't go the first six or seven days of trial. And uh, when I went to New York City... I tried to get in, and I think it was during that still that the COVID policy, so you could only have four civilians and four journalists. Although I have to say, when the journalists maxed out the, the number four uh, spots, they'll pretend like civilians if they can't get the four spot and sneaking as a uh. civilian. So I think I tried many, many times, and eventually I got sick of it on December 29th. I got there maybe 1.30 or 2 in the morning, staying in line, and uh, there were three people ahead of me. They're professional standing, so they're getting paid by other journalists to stand in there all night. And uh, the person's- What a job. Yeah, but I'm too old cheap, so I have to stand in uh, yeah. like a normal person. <laughs> and the person standing ahead of me, uh, standing was for Julie K. Brown, who wrote an article for 2007 in Miami. Why did Jeffrey Epstein got such a short amount of time for the crime that he committed? Yeah. And she was there. So it was really nice to meet her and talk to her. And uh, finally, I got in. And, um, you know, first thing in the morning, there was a little bit of talk between defense attorney and a prosecution attorney with Judge Nathan. Within two minutes, they're done. And three hours later, we were just sitting around waiting for something to happen. And then I think they had another meeting around 1, a, 1 p.m., Hmm. A few minutes, then done, and and close it got to five. I thought, oh my god, I have to come back tomorrow, yeah. sleep two hours. And sure enough, somebody said, uh, J Judge Nathan walked in and said, we have a verdict, and we were all stunned because uh, jurors were having difficult time making a decision. It was day three, you said. I, I think something th like that, third or fourth day, or something like that. Yeah, we were talking about this before, and I wanted to ask you it yeah. uh, on the show. Like, what is it that you get out of being in that room that people don't? get when they're watching it outside because this this trial uh Ghislaine was not televised no so like is there anything that you get out of that um I know this sounds really corny but um um I love this country and there's so many wonderful people in this country and uh, I don't know why so many people are suffering uh as a poor working family mm -hmm. in this country right and i think it has a lot to do with not, it's not because they're, they're not working hard it's the system and uh, these super rich elite people have a tremendous influence on our lives and i think um if you really understand how these men think you try to understand their sexual behaviors and or women who really have a a lot of control over them or know them very well so you know elizabeth Holmes, and somebody like Ghislaine maxwell 
um, to me, they're two very important people, in my opinion. It's, it's almost like uh, you get like a poisonous snake, you take their venom and you can make an antidote. Yeah. So if you really want to know how these men think, if you really understand Ghislaine and Elizabeth Holmes, I think we have a better understanding why they do what they do, you know. And I think I've been obsessed because... Um, I was a naive kid in high school. When I graduated, I worked in Michael Dukakis' campaign because I want to help the poor. And of course, I have a different mm -hmm. attitude about uh, politics now. But I thought, if you understand Ghislaine, if you understand Elizabeth Holmes, I think you understand what's going on in the country with the uh, elites, you know? That's what I thought. Well, I think now you made a really good point we were talking about before the show, but how you don't see sitcoms anymore that represent the working class. No. You only see ones where it's extremely wealthy people or some giant vision of wealth, and you were yeah. making the point that they hate poor people. Yes. Or middle class especially. Yes, and I think you show, see shows like Succession, a bunch of billionaires with problems, mm -hmm. or House of Dragon with this royal family and fantasy right. world, but... I remember in high school watching Roseanne, and I know some people have a, a mixed feeling about her, but I think she's wonderful. She I love Roseanne. She presented working class people as people yeah. and uh, all in the family, but uh, there's disdain over poor people. And I hate, uh, I didn't vote for President Trump. I didn't, I didn't, I only vote for Libertarian, but I think one thing that President Trump kind of appreciated is that uh, maybe he doesn't have ability to help the poor, but he at least he listened to them. Yeah. And and I think someone like Hillary was kind of rude to poor people, you know. And she is smart, she is rich, she is elite, but um, I don't like the way they treat the poor people in this country because they they really are the back backbone of this country, right? They Absolutely. really yeah. are. And um, only time you see really big chunk of representation of poor people is like Jerry Springer show. And that's a little bit unfair too, you know? Well, and it's a heightened version well, of that. Cause even Jerry Springer is not, time. it's not real. Yeah. It's, it's all, it's right. It's cast and it's kind of edged to, to be more ridiculous than the middle class really are. They're just people that want to live and, and love and, and be happy. Yes. And it's, it's seen as uh, like you're lesser than, yeah, to be in the middle class when it's like you said, it's like the it's the backbone, it's the lifeblood of America. And when you see so, like a politician finally actually listen to you and not some in in a way that seems fake and like a politician, I think that's why Trump did so well. Yeah, and Hillary called uh, poor people deplorable, you know. Right. And then, um, these are decent people, and you know, David, you you travel the country, you do comedy, you meet these people. They're they're not a, a type of people you. are you see on television, they're decent people. Mm -hmm. Of course. Maybe, maybe, maybe they're not as sophisticated like people in New York City and LA, but tr truly kind and wonderful people in Midwest and South, and they, they get ridiculed. I don't like that at all. Yeah. No, and you had her, you know, t and even going after black people by her carrying around hot sauce and being yeah. like, I always have it in my purse. It's like, no, you don't. Uh, no, you and don't. It, I think, yeah, that's the problem too, is, is the elites pandering, but now it's the elites dividing. Yeah. And I, and, you kind you started an interesting industry and you see how the elites kind of operate and go in on these people. Like, how do you see, I guess what I'm asking is the elites, the, the way that they're dividing the country now. Yeah. Like you can see that like somebody like Epstein and people like that, they use money, they use sex, they use these proclivities, you know, to kind of empower people, you know, to, if that makes sense, empower yes. the people that they need empowered. A hundred percent. And I, I, most of the comedians know me because um, prior to doing stand-up, I was working sex business. I yeah. work for one of the biggest porn companies. So I'll be honest, I watch so much porn and I see world in, in a very pornographic ways, you know. And I think I was telling you before the show, I think in the kind of porn that you watch tells me everything I need to know. But it's almost like a credit report emotionally, right. <laughs> you know. And I thought when I went to... Um, MAGA rallies, nice people. You just got to be respectful, listen to their fears and, and, and their, their hurt people, just like black people are. And um, predominantly, fa their favorite porn was, uh, I don't want to be too crude, but Big Breast, you know? Yeah. And most of the MAGA people tend MAGA. to be... MAGA. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And most, like them great. <laughs> most of them are uh, white folks, and their ancestors come from Northern Europe, and primary diet of Northern European historically has been dairy, and where does dairy come mm. from? Big breast. And if you look at, like, uh, uh, BOM, and they're nice, too. You just got to be calm and listen to what they have to say. And um, 
um, their favorite kind of porn is uh, ass porn, you know, because blacks and Latino and Asian people things come from southern region of the world. So sometimes when you hear them argue, it almost sounds like they're saying tit ass, tit ass, right? <laughs> <laughs> but my feeling is like, guys, it's okay to like tits and ass. What's sad to me is they actually have more common than differences. Yeah. They're, they're concerned about what's going on in the country. They're concerned about uh, how to take care of their family, the future for their kids. Um, I got to tell you, white, black, or Latino, Asian, if you talk most of the parents, they tell me they believe that their kid's going to do worse than them. This is like a common thing I heard. Now, this this is not a concern of elite. They know their kid's going to be well, and their right. grandkids, they have the money. And um, I work in the sex business for a long time, and I noticed... Um, the super elites, they're not into big breasts or asses. They're always similar kind of body type, whether I go in Upper East Side or, or, or Kensington in London area or Ginza in Tokyo or anywhere posh and rich. Uh, these rich folks always have uh, women that, you know, t pretty tall, lean, no breasts, no asses. And uh, it's interesting because it's that kind of similar kind of body type that Epstein was into, young girls, you mm. know, not fully formed, easier to dominate and manipulate them, you know. But yeah, that's like the common thing with these elites. They always have similar body types, whether they're white, black, Asian, Latina. And yeah, it's an interesting way to think about it because it is something that is like ingrained in, into us is like the sexual attraction and how that can be kind of can tell you a lot about a person. Yeah. But you have this idea of perfection where there's not the giant breast, ass, yeah. whatever, like the billionaire, you know, and not all of them. We were talking about how Warren Buffett comes off like a completely different kind of guy who yeah. has always just had an interest in money. He enjoys what he does. He's seems to be uh, on the up and up, you know, and then you have somebody like Epstein who, as you were talking about earlier, would actually find the flaws, what was missing from the group. And I thought that was interesting where it's like, okay, well, this scientist is poor. He's obviously not getting a lot of women, you know, or you have this guy who's getting a lot of women, but he doesn't feel like he's educated, even though he's a billionaire. So how do we connect these two scientists? Well, I can also use girls, you know, and you eventually, you he figures out how to have the power just by using very simple street smarts i mean and you also visited i mean not epstein island let's be very clear <laughs> yeah but you did see you i did do want to go there i'm, I'm yeah. not lying i would like to go there no he, um i noticed like every one of them he is good at like most con men uh exploit your insecurities mm -hmm. right so like we we're saying like you know a lot of these billionaire silicon valley guys never finished college so they want to get some reassurance or uh, uh, credibility from somebody higher up in the academic world so um since Billionaires have money. Epstein will bring these scientists or writers, and they don't have any money. So that the enticement of money and also access to young, beautiful models, you know, because he, he put money into a um, um, modeling agency too. So there's a fresh supply of mm. uh, 18 years or older ladies, but also Ghislaine and, and uh, Sarah Collin, I think her, her name was, they were able to provide young girls for... Um, um, Epstein, allegedly. When you were talking yeah. about uh, in her trial, she went up and had she spoke and how powerful her presence was. And she has this power that kind of like draws you in. And that's her job is to bring men in, to bring clients in, to bring yes. the the young girls in and how, how the power dynamic there and just being who she is kind of it makes her perfect for that job. You're 100% right, because during the trial, she never spoke. I think the defense attorney said, we will, it's better to protect you this way. At the uh, sentencing, you know, every one of the victims spoke. And I've been reading about this case for a long time. And when you actually see the Jane Doe with the actual name and her face, and I know exactly what happened to them, you, you just feel for them because I'm old enough to be their still older brother or dad is in age, right? And um, it's just terrible. And even like when Annie Farmer, one of the most credible uh, person, her um, she took abuse because she didn't want to take opportunity for her older sister, Maria Farmer, as an artist, you know. And, uh, and when they spoke, you just can't feel bad, uh, nothing but feel bad for them, right? Yeah. Then I thought Judge Nathan's going to sentence the, uh, her and then... Defense attorney said, now Ms. Kelly Max would like to speak. And I was, everybody got quiet in the room because... We didn't expect that at all. She went up, and I gotta tell you, I find I, I I think you told me you just got back from UK. Yeah. 
I never understood the word posh, right? Until Ghislaine spoke. It's her upbringing, hanging out with the upper class, royal family, uh, Cambridge and Oxford education. She completely seduced me. Like I thought, maybe these girls are exaggerating. Maybe these girls are not as innocent as I thought. Mm. But she was, she took command of the room, you know? And no wonder when she was able to uh, introduce Epstein to these royal family and, and prominent people, that's her strength. She is so good at talking to the most powerful, most educated, uh, richest people, uh, most elite, elite of the elite of all, you know, the whole planet. And uh, uh, I was completely seduced. And next day when I was reading the transcript, oh my God, she didn't even admit she was wrong. She yeah. never took it for something. But they were, the way she spoke really seduced me. And, uh, um, you know, I, I think... Yeah, I, I think this is why uh, even someone is lying, you just take people like that for granted because they just seem like they know what they're talking about. Whereas someone like me with broken English in the working class, nobody will take us serious, you know? Mm -hmm. right. Even if we are sincere, because I think we live in a society that we, we worship experts, authorities, you know, charisma and things like that. And I think that's why they get away. You only have one famous person vouching for you. He's a convicted child molester. It doesn't matter. You only need one and that's it. Everybody starts supporting Epstein and that, that was the end of it. And that's Jimmy Savile we were talking about in England getting away yeah. with it for so long. Decades. Because you just had people that were of royalty or of no any notoriety just saying like, oh no, it's, it's fine. Yeah. Give him a key to a kid's hospital. What could go wrong? You and, know, and, and they let it happen. And what's crazy, when we were talking before the show, like, um, he even kind of mentioned in, 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 during conversation, like, oh, you know, because I like to kiss. He, he was kind of actually admitting all the therapy things he was doing, mm -hmm. but because he was telling it as a joke, nobody took it serious, you know. And everyone knew that uh, he was doing that, but none of the kids knew, like, nobody's going to believe me. Just like these girls, right. like, who's going to believe me over Ghislaine? It's the same story over and over. Which I find interesting because you were at Danny Masterson's trial. Actually, I do want to ask this first. When Ghislaine, the verdict was read, what was her response? Um, typical English uh, uh, stoicism, no response at all. Um, I think her uh, two sisters, uh, Isabel and Christine, was there. And I always get the brother's name confused, but uh, they were there. And, uh, you know, she just didn't cry. Then panic and then scream. I want to live. <laughs> that's one. That's one thing. I I, I watch but, a lot. But of, it makes sense though. Like she might have a second. Sorry to might but, like she. But she almost like this isn't over yet. I have the power to maybe come back. And also, it's undignified to cry over that stuff too. Right. And after the trial, I thought as we walked out of the court, you'd think the Maxwell family would get on the vehicle and drive away. They walk home, so we followed them for fifteen minutes. Oh, wow. And Sorry. they were asking all kinds of invasive questions, you know, but. Uh, well, uh, what I was going to say is uh, I watch a lot of true crime stuff with like, yeah. my wife and whatnot. And we, we watch these trials and almost every time when a uh, judgment comes down and they have the camera on the person, they never react how you think they're going to. Right. You think they're going to be like shocked and it, it does happen every once in a while. But a lot of the times it's it's just nothing. You you get this just no reaction. And it's, it's a very shocking kind of thing because you expect it to be animated this is like a person's life getting destroyed but it's not and it's like what you experienced yeah i, I you know my reaction when i saw that i thought maybe um she had a bunch of options you know because for mm -hmm. one thing um she has information that i'm sure fed would be interested in i'm sure um you know and uh there's always still that talk about um, she might know where Robert Maxwell's fortune's heading away, supposedly, you know. Mm. So I thought um, maybe because of that, but you just don't know what she's thinking, you know. And I think I'm still kind of uh, surprised that she's still alive, to be honest, you know. Yeah, I, I, I think too. Uh, you know, something might have happened, but... Because a lot of people think Epstein's alive, but what's your take on that? Um, I've heard that before, but um, yeah, I, I think he's... Is dead. Yeah. Um, I feel like she would have pointed fingers or had some information. Well, I thought it was a bad news for her because if he, if Epstein's alive, she would have been government's witness and she would, she would have been fine. Now that Epstein's gone, they have to... It's all her now. Yeah, now that they can't get gold medal, you're going for silver medal, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think, you know, government's like business too. They They have to have a 
story, nice ending for the story for them to look good, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that's why, I mean, that's why I th- I think Epstein is, is dead. But I'll tell you what's keeping I don't me think alive. Magic Spoon. <laughs> Magic Spoon is very, very healthy. And if you're looking to stay alive, unlike Jeffrey Epstein, mm-hmm. I would highly recommend something like this. I actually really do like it. I've been losing weight. As you see, Garrett's lost a lot more weight than me. But there's a variety of flavors. You can get cocoa, fr- uh, fruity pebbles, frost. Actually, you can't say pebbles, technically. Yeah, you can't say that. That was my bad. Don't blame the company. You but can anyway. get the, the variety of flavor. Like, you can get a whole pack. You yeah. Can choose your own. It's but, like a, an adventure. But the best part cereal. is zero grams of sugar, th- uh, 13 to 14 grams of protein, four to five net carbs, only 140 calories per serving. And again, it's gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free. So I've been, honestly, I didn't know if I would like it at first. I like it. I love it. My favorite's the peanut butter. Not going to lie, but the cocoa. Peanut butter's pretty good, man. Yeah, it is. I peanut like the chocolate, best. too. And if you want to get a deal, go to magicspoon.com slash normal, and you can get a deal on the variety pack by using the com- promo code, again, normal. And that's going to go ahead and help you live a little bit longer. You know what I mean? Help you take a a little bit better care of yourself. You don't have to keep eating all the crappy sugar off the shelves. You can just enjoy something. It's backed with 100% happiness guarantee. Again, that's code normal. Magicspoon.com slash code normal. And you will save $5. I got to use that code. That's amazing. No sugar. Good for them. I know. Yeah, I know. I don't know how they do it. It's magic. It's my... Addiction problem, sugar. Dude, that's the one I have left because I did everything else. And that's the <laughs> one I battle with now. <laughs> it's like, you've got to be kind of the same, I would assume. Or it was it just yeah, it's your worst one, sugar? Uh, sugar. Um, I don't make enough money doing um, stand-up, so I have to do medical testing. So they check my blood all the time, so I have to oh. be careful what I eat. Well, that's I've heard that's how you kind of finance all these trips to yeah. go around and see the things you see. Yeah. And they particularly look for, like, uh, um, Japanese people, because Japanese people metabolize medication better than any other race. Really? Yeah. So, like, you have to be in certain weight, uh, height, and, like, non-smokers and things like that. So I've been traveling the country and meeting other poor people traveling the country being, you know, medical whore for this. Uh, <laughs> 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 guinea pig sounds too kind. So, um, yeah, yeah. Do you ever have any crazy side effects? Don't tell us what it is, but. No, only thing. Or uh, well, you can. It's just a warn. <laughs> we just I don't want to get sued. No, no, no. Um, I don't mention the name of the companies. But the only worst one is like, uh, you know, whenever you do these studies, they ask like AE, which is adverse effect. Huh. And like, um, nobody said anything for like, like, I guess this has only happened to me. So like I told him like my shit turned green for like three months, like <laughs> incredible Hulk <laughs> level green, you know? What? Then as soon as I said it, everyone else, oh my God, me too. And like, well, how come I'm the one saying it? It's because people are afraid to get kicked out of the study and stop receiving money. So we're reluctant to say there's a problem, but you have to. It seems counterintuitive. They yeah. need to know so they could fix it. So um, they would test on... Uh, are coming in bleeding and they're like, no, I'm good. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> I'm okay. My anus is fine. Did you, you sign the check there? Please thank you. A red diaper. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, it's fine. Please. <laughs> just keep, pay me. Just keep the money coming. <laughs> just keep it on. Keep it on. I, I hurt. But yeah. sorry. <laughs> no, but I think that's amazing that you do it because you've seen so much. I mean, like you, you have the same uh, fascination. I shouldn't say fascination, but interest in serial killers as I do. Yeah. And I think they have a, a common, you know, place to what people we just talked about. Epstein's yeah. even like a Bernie Madoff. And I was thinking we were talking a bit earlier at the end of the De Niro, Michelle Pfeiffer movie. They're explaining to Bernie Madoff that he's a sociopath. Yeah. And he can't wrap his head around it. He's like, well, that's Jeffrey Dahmer. That's they're like, but that's you also, because you don't mind taking out the lives of so many people mm-hmm. in a different way. And he's like, well, I don't understand. This is just money. And I think it's, it's such a fascinating thing when we're talking about the elites and how they have kind of the same mentality or the same narcissism as serial killers. Yeah, this is a really difficult thing because I, I, I know this is such a con- counterintuitive thing to say, but there is a place for psychopath in society, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. I think uh, I think John Ronson wrote a book for psychopath test, and they were saying something like I, I don't I don't know exact figure, but between ten to twenty percent of CEOs mm-hmm. are psychopath, and for people to make tough decisions, and sometimes you have to fire people, it's necessary for people like that. Just like 
if we're in a war, we need a fighter pilot who are psychopath. They, they don't panic, kill their enemies. So there is place for people like that. It's just balancing how much you could tolerate in society, you know. But I th personally, you know, I was in New York City last week. And my friend Patrick and I, we were filming. So we covered three people, uh, um, Rex Hellerman, a uh, Long Island serial killer. He was an architect. And he's a shirt he killed two dozen or so, but around that number. And of course, um, it was two days uh, after 9-11. Uh, so Mohammed Atta killed thousands of Americans, of course, yeah. scumbag. Also architect. He knew exactly where to head. And, but we also cover Leon Black that day, uh, yeah. uh, the, the, the uh, benefactor of Jeffrey Epstein, you know, who was hiding the fact that he paid him $157, $158 million for uh, some kind of consulting fees. Mm. Um, in my opinion, um, I'm not an economist, but every 1% of un unemployment go up, um, you're ruining people's lives. You know, during the financial crisis, people lost their lives, yeah. jobs, domestic violence, sexual assault. You know, all this thing kind of happened when the, there's an economic crisis and unemployment. So when Bernie Madoff say, I'm not a psychopath. No, you're a psychopath. You just hurt people differently, but you do hurt people. In fact, I would make an argument that these renegade investors who make reckless vet and then end up expecting the government to bail them out these people never face consequences for their action. Bernie they're was removed. Uh, yeah. They've removed themselves from that situation so then they can believe that they're not. Yes. And and our our the way our system works, it's easy to get away. It's yeah. it's, it's 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 you could hurt millions of people as a white collar with a suitcase than the guy with a gun, you know. You said uh, this 10% yeah, kills in people, literally. CEOs, right? I I believe it's a, it's the same it's a very similar number in politics. Because you're messing with the same kind of things, a lot of people's lives, you're making decisions that, like over the pandemic, same thing happens is you've got unemployment all over the place because they've shut down everything and domestic violence yeah. and just death. So you're messing with the same kind of, uh, you know, levers and they have those that, they just don't have that empathy switch in their brain. I, what, what is it that, for you, like, what do you think that the humanity benefits from that? Because it, we definitely have it in our our genome, right? To yeah. be psychopaths. I mean, you know, um, I don't know if you guys saw that one of my favorite show on Netflix, Mindhunter. Mm. And I think it's a great, it's, show. It's great show, yeah. Great show. And one season, and uh, I think one of the episodes, one of the uh, therapist person was. Uh, was saying, well, I don't know how you could be president of the United States not being a sociopath. You know, yeah. the power that you want, you know, and uh, uh, with the serial killer and I, I think even terrorist uh, and uh, of course these billionaire uh, investors committing this terrible uh, risk, um, they all have like fantasy is like a big thing. Power is another thing. Control is one, another thing that they're concerned, you know. So I think I don't really differentiate three all that much i just know that investment people cause more pain and and, and damage you know yeah. look at what made of that for those people and and yeah. suicides and deaths yes and, and then you add up i mean and just recently there was a, a like their first they're trying a ceo that is actually ai where it's like <sighs> what? A, yeah what? It, it was just a story i read yesterday where it's like you have no empathy i'm like it's perfect it's a perfect ceo you know, because you've just created essentially a computer sociopath, yeah. and that's exactly what the job can be. But um, I'm with you that. in the sense of what it causes is so much more destruction. And then you look at a lot of serial killers, and what they want to do is they. We were talking about um, BTK, yeah, Dennis Rader, yeah, and he almost is invisible. He's almost staying hidden, and whatever it is, the fantasy that he wants to keep fulfilling, or anybody who wants to keep fulfilling in, in in that world, is to sneak out and try to get this gratification that doesn't exist because the fantasy never lives up to the reality, no matter what it is. One hundred percent right. Yeah. You know, so he's sneaking out to go and do that. And then I think there's some CEOs and I think narcissists that want to do such a good job yeah. that they really do want to be seen as like almost in, in, in ways the second coming or want to create something so great mm -hmm. that that can be the benefit of somebody who's a psychopath. Or, you know, and I, you can get great creations from somebody whose need is to look so good. Yeah. Well, the BTK, they, he, he came out and was on TV. They interviewed him way later. and then Oh, yeah. So you always have that like tendency to be like I I did those things. Well, he wanted, yeah. There he was, wants to he be almost wanted to be found. found out. Oh, yeah, that's his beautiful face. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. Ugh. 
Yeah, believe it or not, much worse looking now. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, he's lost all his teeth and stuff. It's it's amazing when you know, like God forbid, if one of us commit the kind things mm-hmm. that he did, right? If we get caught, we, we obviously you're going to feel sorry for yourself because you don't want to go to prison, but you feel bad what you did. But boy, he was completely different. He 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 was kind of happy that he got caught because he was so happy to present his artwork. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. to him, when he murdered these people, it's it's a performance art, you know. Just like some people believe when Mohammed Atta attacked New York City, it's one of the dark art performance art of the century, you know. So when you're dealing with these kinds of people, you, you can't really r- rationally argue with them, you know. They're, they're, how do you battle that madness? Yeah. It's difficult, you know, especially for like working class, decent Americans. They can't fathom people thinking like that. Especially when he still has art that is connected to people that haven't been found. Mm-hmm. He's claiming that it's not them. So there's still some level of a game with that. And then you have Muhammad Atta. You were saying um, designing a house uh, earlier involving an architect. Oh, yeah. he uh, He's an engineering major, but he's also studied architecture. Yeah. And I think I read something early on that, um, you know, um, just like Robert Moses controlled urban city planning for New York, he hated, like, minorities. So he, he created a certain freeway to prevent black people from going to park and things like mm-hmm. that. Yeah. Um, the way you design your home have a consequence how you uh, uh, control people's uh, behavior. So he, he built homes where he only made narrow hallway for women to walk. So they're not they're, 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 they could do their daily chore but not be seen, and they have a balcony where you cannot see from outside, prevent the women being seen by public and things like that. So he wanted to control everyone's uh, movement. You know, men have more freedom, and women should be sequestered and do their job, not being seen and things like that. He's so, trying to make reality. Yeah, he's trying to build this kind of facade of this is how things should be. So I'm going to make it that by just the function of a building. Yes, sir. And, and like you play video games, right? Yeah, yeah. Isn't that what you do with Minecraft? You build the homes and stuff yeah, like right. that. But he was turned up for like uh, uh, for ISIS idea of uh, right. Al Qaeda version of uh, satisfying for for them, you know? Uh, yeah. And that's. I want. I want you to. Sh- I, I. I'm trying to figure out a way to get into this. When uh, Osama bin Laden was uh, taken. I don't. Why did I say taken when they shot up? <laughs> when they shot the bastard and uh, killed him, um, is there any wish you would have involving that? Oh, okay. So people ask me because you know I, I work for a company called Evil Angel and I was a DVD producer and I think on like seven fifty eight hundred films. So people still ask me, do you still have fantasy? My fantasy is that um, um, the government, U.S. government, say he had a bunch of porno with him, right? Uh, I mean, you know, he's, he lived in one spot for seven years, yeah. three wives, so I'm sure he could bore. So he went to watch porn. So my fantasy is I pray to God one of the porn that he was watching is the movie I made. <laughs> <laughs> my movie is so good, and he's <laughs> masturbating it. <laughs> And he's going, gee, ha, 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 ha. And then as he <laughs> as he making all this noise, he doesn't even hear the Navy SEALs walking up the stairs oh. to kill him. And that's my fantasy that I had some play uh, yeah. getting around Bin Laden through one of my, you know, uh, porn. Yeah. That, uh, <laughs> You're part of SEAL <laughs> Team Sam. Yeah. fantasy. Yeah. Just the fapping was so loud that he just didn't hear the Navy SEALs sneak up. <laughs> one, uh, one congressional blue balls of honor or something like that, right? So, um, Before the load of his brains were blown all over the street. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I just want you to share that. I was trying to figure a way to ask it, I just because I love that joke. So I know, much. I know the country's divided, and I, I, I think people get mad at each other for different positions, whether you like Trump or dislike. But I do know one subject matter: sex is something that unites people. You know, like when I go to the biggest porn uh, convention in world, I think it's one in Venice, uh-huh. Berlin. I notice like people who traditionally don't like each other because there's naked ladies around. <laughs> it's hard to be angry when you see tits and asses. Right, like no, it's it's like going to a strip club with like somebody's uncle who doesn't like you. Yeah, you know what I mean. When you're young, like, all, ah, yeah, all of a sudden it's that's like that's a perfect example. Yeah, so <laughs> I was there, and like it was the first time I see a Jewish person with Muslim. They love talking about big asses, and they see a white and black person, Japanese and other non uh, non Japanese Asian. It's like one of the few times porn kind of unite men, you know. So I I I think it kind of put me in a really weird. Uh, path in life but uh, you know even when I was visiting Afghanistan um, 2012 because you know when if anybody invites me to go there 
I'll, I'll show up, you know. That's what I love about you is you yeah. just go everywhere. I went, and my friend Kimberly Motley, only American practicing law in Afghanistan, she said, hey, you want to go polycharchy president, biggest president in Afghanistan? Of course. I went there, and they're very famous because under um, Soviet rules, they executed so many people there. Mm. So while she was helping her three Western clients, I'm inside the prison in like a little... Um, not a gym, but it's like an open air place. You kind of stand and get sun, you know, and there's a bunch of uh, walls with a fence where people kind of stay outside, but they have to be within those cage, you know? A lady's speaking room. Um. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> one of those small hallways. Yes. <laughs> so one of the security guards said, like, he spoke little English. And like, what do you do? And like, Kim told him, like, hey, he's a comic, work in porn. And they didn't believe me because... It's more believable that I'm spy than the comedian, this, you know, <laughs> pornographer, right? Well, yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, there was a group of guys getting their hair cut, and then one guy waved at me. So, like, you know, somebody being friendly, I wave, and, and the guard said, oh, you just waved to Taliban. So, um, um, <laughs> like, oh, I don't want to <laughs> wave to guys who killed Americans. And eventually he took me to talk, and, like, it was the strangest conversation. He was translating for us, but he said, do you know Sasha Gray? Which I do, but... It, I never thought I'll be talking to Taliban about Sasha Gray, you know. It's weird. It's weird. Porn connects like people. Connected. He'll put, he'll put his Koran away for a second and talk about porn, you know. Right. He's yeah. a radical. Yeah. Yeah, when he's oh. thinking about death to America, he's like, but not Sasha. Yeah, Sasha's okay. <laughs> oh, you know what's interesting? Another thing that I, I could talk to Afghan, they love uh, American action film. They love Schwarzenegger. They do. Sylvester Stallone. Uh, um, you Gangster know, John, films too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, it just shows like, yeah, they don't like American occupation, but boy, American pop culture is the most powerful thing in the whole world. It's the most powerful thing. It, it, they could pretend to hate America, but that part they cannot hate. Well, they love what, our movies. That's one thing that we talk yeah. about on Friday Night Tights. We, yeah. we, we talk about it so passionately because pop culture, it is something that we export. To the rest of the world. We seduce the whole that, planet. Right. And it's something that is being so like subverted now to, you know, whatever propaganda it is, like communist propaganda slowly through these, these stories and uh, th these agendas. And, and it's not just affecting the people that like grow up with it. It's affecting how the world sees us. Yes. And how the world interacts with America. And now that we're having these move these movies that are just so... Like you said, the the '80s action movies. I wish they'd come back because it was such a such a time for like America being powerful. Ronald and Reagan, was, yeah. right? Yeah, it was like it was sending out a message, and now we just send out this just weak soy like beta kind of message through our all of our media because we're just not allowed to to express that kind of confidence i guess you know my dad my, one of my dad's favorite movie was high noon you know and you look Such at gary cooper right. uh when everybody abandoned him but you know he stood strong and this is like american ideal you know and when things get tough you stand up for yourself right. and protect the community and my dad loved that movie and this is only like you know six or seven years after world war ii but like we love these, you know, sometimes we get how great this country is. Sometimes we forget ideals that we have and yeah. we forget that. And I hate, um, I, don't, I don't like this division stuff, you know, because I think this is kind of like, uh, you know, Marxism to me is uh, cancer and all this like gender study or, or yeah. they're just very of, of, of cancer, you know. And I think uh, when you don't, when you travel the country, actually most people do get along in this country. They really do. Then they tend to hold yeah, the same opinions on that yeah. as well. And a lot of them are afraid of it because of what the media has told them or what yeah. they have to believe. Or And they, they honestly, it's like you said, it all comes down to what they want. They want their world to be better for their kids. And Absolutely. Like I randomly popped on, and it's not a good movie, but it was uh, Wall Street 2. Uh, oh, yeah. The other day, uh, but Shia. yeah, and but Michael Douglas is making this speech in the movies from twelve years ago about how you're going to be the generation that doesn't have doesn't have jobs that doesn't have the you know, yeah. and he has this uh, sort of spot on speech to really what's happening is yeah. that you're going to not do as well as your parents is essentially what he's saying, and it brings it back to what you said was there is a huge truth to that because I, as a father I look at my son. and and there's nothing I want more in the world. You have four children, you know, is for them to do the best and better than I could ever do. And it's the first time I think we all fear that. I don't know any parent 
who doesn't worry about that unless you have a silver spoon, but that just means they're going to do as good as you. Yeah. Those super billionaires and their uh, kids, you know, and then these, uh, what what do you call them, champagne socialists? Yes. These rich kids <laughs> yeah. pretend to be poor, you know, they're just dangerous, you know, but um, I don't think uh, it's good to divide the country. And um, every time I go overseas, like, um, you have no idea how many people want to come here and how much they love America and how lucky we are. These kids, these elite kids are so rich, they have to manufacture problems, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah, a lot of them pretend to be comics. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> you just see them, they're yeah. the worst. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I think I'm so lucky to be here, you know? And I, I, I just, they should be proud and... Um, it's really like kind of scary. Like, how could you, you have no, why don't you go overseas and see how terrible America is? I've said that about, um, a friend of mine named, uh, Art, whose dad came over from Russia. Oh God. Uh, yeah. And yeah, he came because of the Detroit Red Wings and yeah. he actually ended up getting paralyzed in a, a limo accident, unfortunately, but, uh, they still have done very well. He was the wings trainer and he's yeah. talking about how just waiting in bread lines and the freezing cold and, and all these things that we, we could never possibly comprehend. Mm. Or yeah. I think it was uh, either Fedorov or Konstantinov who got here and went into a grocery store. And this is like, you know, KGB crying yeah. because they can't control the emotion of trying to comprehend that they could buy anything they wanted. Yeah. You know, it's like, no, you can get anything you want. They're like, I don't... It, just at a grocery store, like they can't... Like, what do you mean I can get anything I want? Like, anything? I can get anything I want here? Mm -hmm. Like, because to them, that's a, that's winning the lottery over and over and over and over and over again. And we live in a country of people who constantly battle because we, we've we lost gratitude so much. Perspective is gone. Yeah. It's completely and, gone. And I actually went to Chernobyl, actual Chernobyl. Oh, too. wow. Okay. And I also saw the show on HBO called Chernobyl, mm -hmm. where if you, it's a great series and mm -hmm. uh, basically... Um, what destroyed Soviet Union, one of many things was they constantly lie to people and they're, they're, they're trying to, um, you know, lie. They're against real reality, you know, and I think that's what's going on in the United States. Like right now, if you just say, no, that's a man, not a woman, people get mad at you, you know, simple truth, yeah. you know, and I, I think there's a little bit of optimism on my part too, because now people are not afraid of being called racist or whatever. We're getting sick of these liars trying to ruin the country, you know. I think yeah, there's there's definitely a, a, a sense of the pendulum coming back from yeah. because for so long it and I've had this argument before uh, is we were kind of just lulled into just believing everything and not paying attention and just kind of doing what you know, doing our job and not yeah. paying attention to the to the establishment or what propaganda is being put into our movies and and stuff like that and so many more people seem to be awake from from that kind of sleep they have double-edged sword of social media where they can get a lot of propaganda, but then they can also talk to their fellow man yeah. and, and discuss these things and be vocal about these things. So I, I do think it's it's kind of coming back the other way. I hope so too, because, you know, when I, I was a naive kid, I didn't understand economics and things like that. So 1988, as a young kid graduating from uh, high school, I worked for Michael Dukakis' campaign, but now I'm older, I understand economic policy and uh, things, things like that. Um, Oh, shit. I don't, I don't know where I was going with that. Every time like, I think Michael Dukakis, I just yeah. think John Lovitz going, my my parents were little people, <laughs> little swarthy people. Yeah. Like, that's as much as I remember, but I do remember the camp. I do remember his campaign. But you were saying with the Democrats at the time. Um, it's just this. You wanted to help the poor because there was an, there is an idea, especially growing up in Detroit where I did, there's that, that idea of, uh, you know, protecting the poor. Yes. The idea mm -hmm. of... Um, unions the you know uh being non-corrupt the idea of and you want them to be yeah i mean you really do the idea of a union is a great thing it's just is it not being bastardized right it gets corrupted you, you get overboard yeah and i think um you know um it's kind of really weird to see right now where dnc is hating Ke kennedy uh but back in those days when his you know father and, and uncle was alive there was a certain obligation that rich people have. For Something the happened to the Kennedys. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, this is Dallas have, too. Oh my God. All right. I'm not going to say anything. Have you been to the, the mark? Yes. Oh, I, cool. Years okay. ago, yeah. I figured you did it already. And what am I even asking? <laughs> 
But these super elites, you know, they don't live anywhere. They, they spend a couple months here. They fly into Paris, they're Moscow, wherever, right? Yeah. So they don't feel they don't feel like part of the community. So they don't feel like they have obligation to help the, the poor in their neighborhood. And this is such a like uh, sad time, you know. I think uh, um, it drives me crazy because I think. You know, most conservative people tend to be religious, so they feel like there's original sin. But when you meet these like Hollywood liberal kids and like Upper East Side kids, you know, it never occurred to them that they could be wrong or they could be evil, mm -hmm. you know. Right. And that's why they're always making fun of poor people and, you know, unsophisticated people. But yeah, I think you should be a little bit more humble that I could be wrong. I could make a mistake. I might have done some bad things. Um, try to be a little bit more humble about that but these super elites they don't give a shit when they yeah. make a decision they, it never really occurred to them like the consequence for others you know yeah especially when you come from a place where you want to have like a charity for somebody yeah or to come off as you if you have empathy and then you you have no ability to have either it comes off so fraudulent and i think that's why people mm. I think, and it's sad, but I think it's why when you see somebody in Hollywood get taken down like a Weinstein or yeah. something like that, you do see a little bit of America kind of cheer because they feel like they've been talked down to for so long. Yes. You know, and I, and I don't know if where he started was bad. I don't know. You know, I mean, he put out Tarantino movies. He did things. There's stuff that he did that, in my opinion, you know, yeah. obviously there's good, but you become powerful. All of a sudden you're taking advantage of people. You're a rapist. Like all these things unfold where, you know, did you become that way because you were always a narcissist, mm. power take over you, whatever it was. Um, but it's sad because you, you see people who pretend completely to have uh, to have to have a feeling or pretend that they have a connection yeah. to the poor in this country and they wouldn't stop and give them a quarter if their life depended on it. They make movies uh, uh, sorry okay. they make movies to pander to the mainstream America to make money. Right. They they're so uh insulting to that very yeah. group of people buying you know, tickets you know and i think when they threw uh, made of um uh, they just needed one guy to put all the blame but believe me he wasn't the only one doing that terrible hell thing. no right and and harvey weinstein wasn't the only mm -hmm. one too and they want to have a simple uh narrative to end certain ways but um you know all this hollywood star claimed to be smart independent and uh, uh savvy uh individuals why is it that none of those people said anything about Harvey Weinstein before? Right. Because they're more concerned about their careers, you know? And uh, uh, it's what my friend Tony Manu calls uh, swallower's remorse. They only complain after doing something that they agreed to do with uh, Harvey mm -hmm. Weinstein. They later on like, oh, I'm a victim now. No, there are, there are some of you women that agreed to do it because you want those roles, or you didn't say anything because you want to protect your careers, you know? Yeah. Because for none of those people to say anything, now you know, you guys are supposed to be smart, right? You knew what was going on. You just, you didn't want to say anything because it interfered with your career. Just like in, the, uh, um, um, in Wall Street, I'm sure there's plenty of people who knew uh, what Madoff and all those other people are doing, you know? Uh, well, and you look at even a company like Enron, how many people at the company oh God, yeah. knew when they were like, hey, buddy, you're the new VP. And the guy was like, really? And then like three <laughs> weeks later, meanwhile, one guy sells on all his stock and like lives on a mountain he owns with yeah. money that never existed. <laughs> wow. You know, it, it's insanity. Well, the but... thing about the, like the, the Me Too movement is you were talking about the talking down. Yeah. Is that they... They made him the scapegoat. Yes. While there's still stuff going on, they 100%. they stopped at children. Yes. They never talked about that part, and then they used Me Too as a moment for them to be virtuous and say that we're better than you now yeah. because we're calling it out, even though it was them the whole time. Yes. And they all knew. And I think the right. only one who was honest about it was Tarantino, who said, look, I, I looked at it as the way any producer does unwanted advances, chases the secretary around the desk. Mm. Of course I knew. And any actors who says that they don't, they're lying. Now, he didn't know about rapes, and I do believe that. I, I believe that part, too. You yeah. know, fully, but it's like, I lived in L.A. 20 years ago, and I could tell you that was going on just by people who worked for agencies. 
Oh, okay. I mean, so everybody so, knew that. Well, I mean, but it's like anybody who worked, everybody knew what a casting couch was. You didn't yeah, have to be in Hollywood to be involved. We knew the culture of cinema. Mm -hmm. You knew that that's where the starlets would go when they were first trying out. Yeah. It's always been the culture of Hollywood, and that's not blaming anybody else. It's just saying, obviously, if you're working for somebody, especially that guy who came off like such a <laughs> slime bobby <laughs> pig, uh, it, people knew, and it's like I, and that's one of the things I did like about Tarantino. That, and I still, he's one of my favorite filmmakers. But yes, he just sir. come out and go like, yeah, what? But I didn't. He's like, I didn't. I thought it was the standard Hollywood thing that we all know. But that's part of the business. It doesn't mean I approve of it. But it was just part of the business. What are you going to do as a young filmmaker? Jump in in the middle of Sundance and go. That guy assaults women in the nineties. What would have happened? No one Meryl Streep is, this is God. Literally yeah, yeah. called him God. I think um, a, a biggest reason why Harvey got in trouble because he started having less and less success. Mm. And I think other actors realize, um, you know, Merrimack is not the only place you could get a job. You could go to Hulu and Netflix and Amazon. Yeah. I think that's what diminished his power. And now that he had less power, I think people are less fearful of him and that's how they got him. But if, I, if, I think... If he continued to have success, I don't think he he would have gone to prison. No. Mm -hmm. Just like um, Madoff would have continued to deceive people if it wasn't for housing crisis in 2007 and eight. you know? Oh, that exposed yeah. everything. Yeah. Because that was really the only thing. And it was really his son who I don't think knew about it. No, no. You know, who kind of noticed, like, what are you doing? And, and in this last minute attempt, he was sending out all those bonuses trying yeah, to just yeah. get something to people, you know. Um, but it, it was his son who was like, this doesn't make sense. This isn't adding up. You know, and I believe his son committed suicide. Oh, this one, yeah. yeah. And then the other one, a couple of years later, with cancer, returning. Cancer died, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, he was a psychopath, you know. And uh, his idea, like, why well, didn't murder people, this and that. Like, well, you didn't murder people directly, but you definitely had people's uh, lives taken away. Killed yeah. so many people with that, yeah. you know. And, uh, and I hate to say it, but before we get to our end of the world question, we are almost out of time. I hate to end yeah. on a downer like that. Yeah. But yeah, Bernie. <laughs> Sorry. Old Bernie Madoff. Dang. I think he's dead now, though. Yeah, he died. Yeah, he did die in prison, I think. And that was recently. Yeah, it's a year and a half ago or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I mean, he lived a good life, pretty much. So, silver linings. <laughs> he was you there for like I know. two years. He's dead. <laughs> like, uh, you think he's like Andy from Shawshank Redemption doing everybody's tax return in the yeah, prison yeah. or something? Yeah. Completely doing like, it. Like, don't give that guy tax returns. He's just playing old person. records in the warden's office. <laughs> yeah, who are we doing them for? Like the Crips? Well, before we get to this uh, uh, last bit of the show, you can see me this weekend at the Wonders Theater in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and next Wednesday at Hyenas in uh, right here in Dallas. Oh, yeah. Oh. And also, I do have upcoming dates at the Lexington Theater in Michigan, as well as the Bay City uh, State Theater. Uh, but where are you going to be, QB? Friday Night Tights on Nerdrotic Channel, my channel, and on uh, Bay Staff Mondays on Adam Krigler's channel. And most importantly, where can we find you, Yoshi, besides this Sunday at Mothership? Um, I, I, I'm going to be doing a bunch of shows in Austin, but I haven't figured out what shows yet. But um, my only long-term goal is next year. I just got from Edinburgh Fringe Fest, so I want to do a um, Fringe show in Iceland, Adelaide, Australia, which is the second biggest one in the world, and hopefully go back next uh, August in uh, Edinburgh and uh, do my show, Adult Content. It's a one-man show about my 25-plus uh, years in adult business. Um, it's somewhat funny, but there's a lot of actually sad and uh, stuff in there. Mm. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure. No, and we've even talked before. You've had a, one of the most interesting lives of any human being I've ever met. So I would highly recommend looking up anything involving Yoshi. You will not be disappointed. And I do hope you'll come back. And uh, well, that's, that's a nice way of you saying I'm homeless because I haven't paid, <laughs> I haven't paid rent since February 2012. I'll be honest hey, with you. Hey, that's great. That's amazing. <laughs> I've been couch surfing. Yeah. <laughs> but thank you both. I really appreciate it. This Please, is an incredible studio. On. Thank you. Oh, dude, thank you for coming. Now let's get to the end of the world. Now, this is a very important question. Do you think Ghislaine's Little Black Book will ever come out, Garrett? No way. I think somebody has it, and they're locking that thing down. Angela? Oh, me? Yeah, um, you've been quiet today. Yeah, I've just, it's been a cool show. Um, 
Probably not, man. Mm -hmm. It's locked down. What do you think, Yoshi? If they find it, that's not my number. I swear. <laughs> that's not my number. <laughs> I say in the words of Tom Yoshi. Hanks, I sure hope not. All right. <laughs> Good night, everybody. <laughs>